welcome everybody welcome back to self-care in the sandwiches my name is Mel Wakeman whichever side she is this is Leslie Waldron I'll let her introduce herself in a minute um, we're kind of we are in we are living these sandwiches in terms of we are caring for dependent younger folk in our family our children and also caring for our parents um, who are el elderly and managing kind of chronic conditions so we want to bring this conversation to the fore and talk honestly and openly about how bloody difficult this can be and to give you um, some insight into how we're navigating it and by all means we are not perfect at this we are we would love to learn from you as well but also give you permission to say it's hard and through our own experience and through the work that we do perhaps sort of in terms of our skill basis give you some tips and strategies that we think um, have have helped us so yeah, I'm, I'm a registered nutritionist, I'm a non-diet nutritionist, and I support people that have a difficult relationship with food, usually very anxious, um, overthinking brains, and so I want to bring some elements of that into the conversation today. Leslie, say hello. Hi there, thank you Mel. Um, I'm Leslie Waldron and I'm an integrative women's health coach and I support women to live wildly well through their perimenopause to postmenopause transition, which means integrating good nutrition, movement and sleep and rest. Um, and often the women that I work with are exhausted and overwhelmed and many of them are in this sandwich themselves. And I have two children living at home and I have a mother with Alzheimer's. And, it, the, and it's that that in added challenge that has kind of brought, uh, brought Mel and I together to want to both explore our own experiences and be able to share what's working as well as um, that healing element of knowing that you're not alone in doing all of this. Um, so this week's episode is the cucumber sandwich. <sighs> Who doesn't love a cucumber sandwich? Just the right amount of salt, very thinly sliced. Being very posh just now. Very posh and you eat it with your little finger in the air and a cup of Earl Grey tea. Um, but the main reason it's called a cucumber sandwich is because we're thinking about that cool as a cucumber, that self-care, that real in sense of indulging what you need. And we want to, this episode, explore what we mean by self-care, particularly if you're overwhelmed and over the top with all of your different commitments. It can feel very hard to look after yourself. And we're going to talk about self-regulation and self-awareness, because those are a really important part of the self-care piece that isn't always easy to articulate and easy to explore. So we thought we'd bring you both sides of that um, self-care piece today. Yeah, and it's, I think we've, we've spoken a number of times, Leslie, about how set this self-care, this is the hard self-care. This isn't the kind of, oh, I'm gonna look forward to diving in and soaking in a bath and it's kind of easy to do that or yeah. I'm just going to nip off and go and get my nails done and absolutely mm -hmm. there is a place for that and if you're finding that kind of relatively easy to kind of organize and implement your life please message me because I want to know how that happens but <laughs> <laughs> but it's um the, I think self-care is around navigating the difficult emotions around giving your self permission to do this thing for you when as women we are being pulled in so many different directions and it's also facing the difficulty and I think the resistance that we feel about taking care of ourselves that might involve having difficult conversations yeah putting in place healthy boundaries can be notoriously difficult and that's the hard self-care that really matters so I kind of we want to talk about some of that really and and how that resistance and those difficult emotions show up mm. in our bodies. Because as you mentioned earlier, that, that self-awareness mm. is key Absolutely. to giving us a better understanding about what it is that we're feeling. Mm. And as women, we haven't often been given a voice mm -hmm. 
to say how we are feeling, to name how we are feeling. Yeah. Because society says, you know, you just put the mask on and hey, you can do it all. And I think in terms of articulating those difficult emotions, saying, I don't like them. I am struggling mm. and ultimately asking for help. I don't think we've been necessarily shown how to do no. that. Absolutely. And there is a sense that um, that we should just be able to cope with it all. And, um, and yet, um, there's really clear evidence to show that coping with it all leads to long term, in the long term, just coping with us and dealing with the stress is not great for our health and well-being, isn't great for our relationships and won't ultimately be brilliant for all of those caring, those that we're caring for as well. So bringing in, prioritising that self-awareness and self-care makes, makes this whole process I don't know if easier is the right word, actually, but because um, but it does mean that you are somewhat protected against the impact of being pulled in multiple different directions. I think this kind of practice of self-care can give us a greater sense of self. It, I think we can create more a knowing. Yeah. Um, and it can help us feel more connected to mm -hmm. ourselves so in my practice I do kind of a fair bit of embodiment work and we we work through and talk about a lot of these difficult emotions mm -hmm. because so much of the time we are used to suppressing them yeah. because a we well often we don't know how to deal with them so let's just let's just brush them under the carpet and then mm -hmm. we can pretend that they're not there but of course we know that doesn't work because they come back and bite you in the backside basically and I think we'll, we'll talk about what happens mm. when our self-care practice may not be adequate mm. um, or it's not effective for one reason or another and that isn't to say it's always been like that we sometimes find that as the challenges shift in our life and as our parent parents health and state shifts mm. and our children are going through different things and we're juggling work and you know, we've got these flipping hormones that are pulling us along this roller coaster i think i've just completely lost the track of what i was going to say then we you will can... talk about the perimenopause element of the sandwich in a couple of couple of episodes time though aren't we because i think that is really important i wonder mel if what we should start with is talk about before moving on to talking about that self-awareness self-regulation and feelings is talk about some some of the simple things about self-care because often we can get lost in the big things and we can lo get lost in things taking time. And actually there are some really simple things that can help us. And, and by help, what it does is it means it maintains our energy. It supports um, a slightly more regulated nervous system. It supports our own kind of health and might also support kind of that, that anxiety, um, stress kind of balance as we go through as we go through the day and self-care doesn't need to take really time and it's often the simple sim super simple strategies that keep our body and mind supported small and really easily repeated actions are, are a bloody brilliant place to start um we started to touch on this didn't we in the last episode talking a bit about eating and drinking and and um, acknowledging the need of those. Um, back to basics, wasn't it? Very, really? yeah. very much back to basics. Are you staying well hydrated? Are you making sure that you have, that you are eating, eating when you're hungry and eating meals that are satisfying and give you pleasure and are sufficiently nourishing that you will feel energized? Are you sleeping? And sleep can be something, obviously in our perimenopause years can often be really messed with anyway by declining hormones and by the impact of high levels of cortisol in our system. And so m mitigating that might be reducing the consumption of caffeine and alcohol in order to support really good sleep. Um, but what we want is to for our, to stay in, I, don't, I, it's, I mean, I, we live in this world where we talk quite a lot about our nervous systems, but it's really interesting talking to people who aren't really aware that we have 
this rest and digest, this parasympathetic kind of mode for the nervous empty, a parasympathetic nervous system and a sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight, fight, flight or freeze. And we can often get very much in these sandwiches stuck in fight, flight or freeze. And things that will add to the stress, add to the fight or flight will be not having enough sleep. Um, will be not eating enough, will even be being thirsty because our body will perceive that as a stressor. So I don't know about you, but I would say that I, I get up in the morning and I will, I've got a glass of water for my bed and then I will drink that before I go downstairs. Then I'll have another glass of water before while I'm pottering around in the kitchen making a cup of tea. And generally, before the morning is out, I've had four big glasses of water. Now I know that if I, when I am really good about doing that, that may that is a big part of maintaining my energy. And if I'm dropped, if my mood and such like have dropped by eleven o'clock, I can usually bring that back to water so that's how simple it is and so I will end up feeling more agitated more tired um and I can see because my watch has got like a um a heart rate monitor on it that shows my stress levels I will see my stress levels going up and it will be connected to, to some of that will be connected to my um, water consumption so it's so simple but it has an effect on that moving us out moving us back towards fight or flight when in that rest and digest mode that's when our body repairs itself that's when our body that's when we're better able to think more clearly where it's better when we're um we'll be able to support ourselves in having a good night's sleep that's when we heal that's when we fight off um colds and flu not in fight or flight um, so giving yourself like little sort of micro routines and so yeah. that that's in your morning obviously you're still active you're still going around doing things so it's like this is what i i need to do yeah. right now so the water is the key thing and, for I take, and then have a wee i take it <laughs> you do generally need quite a few wees first <laughs> actually yeah, that is the problem um well it's not a problem it's just a fact of life but um um, so you didn't need to time the school run effectively so that that doesn't become a stressor if you're desperate for the loo while you're taking the children to school. Um, and then there are other little things that I do that are about, um, so I get outside first thing in the morning. This morning I was actually had to put my dry robe on because it was cold and windy and a bit wet, but just to get that daylight, because there again, there's really interesting evidence about get, how if you get daylight early in the morning, it helps to keep, suppress your cortisol levels, to keep your stress levels low. And it has the benefit of resetting your circadian rhythm, which will enhance the quality of your sleep so to me that's a win-win even if the rest of the family think that I'm a bit nuts on a windy day <laughs> going outside with my cup of tea but they're they're like they're simple things that don't really take any time and in my head I'm then going well do you know what I've done that for myself today and I can do some other things as well but those are kind of my absolute baseline level that things that I look after myself and they're generally done before eight o'clock in the morning as well yeah so it's kind of setting the tone for yeah the yeah um and I think I think about the clients that I work with and sometimes I think I think often the morning is the easier time maybe yeah. because we're kind of habitually into that routine and often it's quite static I guess apart from this firefighting moments it's yeah. often later on in the day where the wheels can come off Yes, absolutely. in the morning we may well be you know under the influence of caffeine but we've rested mm. we've hopefully had some breakfast and it's really about prioritizing that you put your oxygen mask on first yes. get yourself set up but as you go through the day and you're exposed to maybe more firefighting or you forget the eating and the drinking and your resilience kind of fizzled out a little bit and then by the time you get to the evening time it's kind of the time where it's just like, well, I might as well just chuck it all in now. And uh, particularly, I think in terms of maybe eating behaviours and so on that I see the evening times kind of conflicted between hungry, tired, exhausted, emotionally exhausted, don't have the energy to even get off the sofa and go up to bed, which I think we touched on a little bit last episode. But yeah, being being stuck in that. So um, I think... If I can share from my experience, 
I have a very active brain. It's very, I'd say it's hyperactive. So mm. when my anxiety levels go up, it just, it just feeds into that. So I really struggle to sit down. Mm. Um, and if things are on my mind and I don't necessarily like processing that, and I don't mean to say that we always have to process that, mm. gentle distractions can be really helpful. Like our brain is a muscle, mm. like any other muscle in the body, it needs a rest. So I have no worries at all about saying I will watch Grey's Anatomy um, <laughs> or what was the other one I watched, Virgin River, some kind of girly, girly yeah. easy watching kind of thing, yeah. uh, maybe with some blood and guts, maybe with some romance. Um, I, I can't just sit there and I struggle to read a book. I can listen to books. I'm trying to pick up crochet again. I I crochet while watching um, television chewing gum, you know, and that so that's again just like you, very busy mind. But the crochet plus the kind of mindless TV stops me from doing that thing, which I know I'm prone to do, and I know it's no good for me, which is sitting and watching TV and scrolling, or as I said last week wandering into the kitchen because I think maybe I need a biscuit because I'm feeling uncomfortable and the discomfort isn't about the biscuit so so the crochet and anything that's simple and repetitive yeah. also is really calming for our nervous system so so I think yeah. it's some of this is about giving yourself permission yeah. when you're kind of playing around and experimenting mm. with a self-care practice there is no set look mm -mm. There, there really isn't like if if you like me um struggle to kind of come down mm -hmm. i can't just press the switch like the lights are going out and i'm like oh there we go i'm just gonna sit and watch this program i'm like fidgeting getting up just checking something coming down so however you might need to kind of titrate yourself mm -hmm. to come down to ground as you may prepare yourself to go yeah. to bed if you're up here that titration may take a fair bit of time mm -hmm. um other things that i often try are kind of maybe getting rid of some of this adrenaline that i have in my body because i'm kind of thinking about all sorts of different things i've got you know as parents and being in these sandwiches there's like 10 no 10 tabs open for mm -hmm. looking at everybody's needs um and so i may well i may well dance around in the kitchen Brilliant. um i may sometimes I will kind of push against the wall sometimes we need to kind of mm. release some of that energy and you get kind of a good chest stretch so I, I know we're kind of on blurry background I don't know I don't know if this will work really but I I kind of push on the wall so I can really stretch my chest out but then I'll kind of go over and mm. it just helps release some of the tension in my shoulders but I can right. practice some deep breathing Mm. and it just gets to mobilize my body yeah. and actually that. both of those help to improve your like they open it open up the muscles around your chest and actually will help you breathe better yeah. and more deeply I think that... when you're really anxious and you're almost checking out yes movement like that can bring you back into your body mm. same I... as breath work dancing around the kitchen it can bring you home a little bit mm. and that means that you're in a better position to be able to kind of go well what am i feeling and mm. like and you can feel the tension and you can notice the bloating and it's much as we might not want to go there these mm. are really important clues they're not bad no There's, release the judgment about what stories you may be holding about holding I call them difficult feelings. They're not negative. They no. just are the, the physical signs and the thoughts and our emotions. They are the clues as to what we might need. Mm, yeah, I think that's so powerful. So when it comes to kind of the acts of self-care, it is the small things, but they are really powerful. And a lot of them will help us to increase our self-regulation and our self awareness so I wonder if it would be good for us to move on to talking about that now Mel and what we might mean by by self-awareness and self-regulation 
Um, and there were there is something very um, something that I've noticed about myself um, is that I feel like I can't predict things as well because I don't know what the next challenge is going to be. And so what I'm so there it has been right at the beginning after my mother's diagnosis, I did do a little bit of catastrophizing and going on my life as I know it is over. Um, do I have to spend the next do I have to spend the next 10 years of my life catering to my mother's needs above and you know above and beyond you I have a sense of a sense of duty and responsibility but I also then built up quite a lot of resentment um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in the next episode alongside guilt um, um, but actually what has helped me is to be able to articulate that and then to start to put in place boundaries around my own thinking as well as boundaries around how far I get involved with this how far I get involved in that next stage and and, and where can I delegate or get support or or anything like that that um thinking too far ahead was taking me out of my body and out of the present moment completely and was making it very hard for me to make rational decisions about the day to day and keeping me in fight or flight all the time. So but it's normal, isn't it? Like that we that we do that because that's part of our anxious brain going, well if we if we can predict all of the outcomes, then I'll have solutions for all of those possible outcomes and then we'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. Yet there's so much wasted energy on that, you know, but that's that's your brain's res natural response coming from fear. So we just yeah, let's just Yeah. Let's just calm things down. Let's just just stay here. Can I sit with this right now? And and allowing, noticing that that's what I was doing. This is where it comes to that awareness. Noticing that I was that that was what I was doing um, enabled me to go. Okay, I need to rein it in. And that's that self awareness. Um, um, that and then not putting not because then what happens the next stage to that that kind of looking too far in the future is that and and worrying too much is that you end up putting your own life on hold like I felt like I couldn't plan I felt like I couldn't plan holidays I felt like I couldn't plan um weekends away I felt like I didn't really know how I was going to support my daughter when she was starting secondary school and and it was like it was almost like I was watching my future shrink and that's not it was really unhelpful so um so I needed to to it's like how do we bring in to understand what's going on stay aware of that um understand your feelings and then put things in place that stop you going there and I don't I think I'm still working on that <laughs> at the moment I mean I I got a coach uh, an emotional well-being coach that I worked with earlier on earlier on this year and tail end of last year, I think and that was massively helpful because it helped me name and feel those feelings and then do with it what I needed to. And I think that's, that's so important. We are allowed to say we're finding something difficult. We're allowed to, I think as part of our processing, it's so important that we speak our truth. That's, yeah. that's what I'm trying to say here. Yes. Um, and so part of that, requires self-awareness mm. so that we can say we can use for example i use a lot of the kind of the physical sensations in our body to help kind of confirm what the thoughts and the emotions are saying in my head because often they they show up together yes absolutely so we kind of you can kind of go with more confidence in terms of yeah well, i'm feeling i'm feeling mm. guilty that will come to or i'm yeah. angry yeah and we can be a bit afraid of saying that we're angry we can be a bit afraid of saying that we don't like what we're doing and I think that helping ourselves to name the emotions that we're going through and perhaps have somebody whether it's a close friend or your partner who you can can help who can listen who can talk through that so that allow you've got a space a safe space to share those difficult emotions can be really helpful as well. And anger's anger's is a really interesting one. Like you say, you know, we're we're kind of told, don't be angry. And well, people are frightened of it because it can be really explosive. Yeah. And Too close to menopause, right? <laughs> yeah, 
never done that before. But I think <laughs> there's also how other people react to that. So yeah. it kind of, when it's unexpected and people don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And I think often as human beings, we are fixers and, and mm. problem solvers. I mean, I, I think about the times where I've just lost it with mm. complete strangers, which I have, or my husband. And it's like, it kind of makes you want to retreat. Yeah. It's not. It's like, oh, I'm not safe to go out in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how could we bring in, how do we bring in self-awareness practices? Mine, like my big thing is both journaling and menstrual cycle tracking. Like almost I have a beginning and end of the day check-in like with pen to paper because that works for me. Um, and as a way of going, well, how do I feel? How am I doing? What's going to make at the beginning of the day? What's going to make the day great? The end of the day, what was the best thing about the day? What could I have done better? And sometimes it will just be a few words and sometimes they'll be... I need to write all of this out otherwise I'm going to explode and I know it sounds really simple um and some people really resist journaling but it doesn't have to be writing beautifully and you could just write it on a piece of paper and then burn the piece of paper but it helps you just get to for me helps can help you really get to the nub of those feelings um, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of journaling but and it's and I think it's only in times of healing your relationship with food it's one of the primary tools mm. that we encourage but it's also one of the most resisted yeah because there are so many expectations around what it's supposed to look like so mm. it doesn't have to be coherent it could be random no. words sometimes um, random words written really hard that the paper is almost broken <laughs> with a must buy loo roll next to it you know like yeah. it's a <laughs> on it. but also i think there's that feeling of well, what if something else comes up? Yeah. That's just going to be more stuff Yeah, that I've got to deal with. And I don't think I can do that. And I think part of, again, I think Leslie and I want to reassure you that you don't have to have all the answers. Mm -mm. The, the emotional processing and problem solving isn't your role necessarily. Mm. You know, by all means, go and get help. But go on, you're going to say something. Something just popped into my head then, which... I, which has come up a few times for me and we might have touched on it this last week but um was in the last episode is that pe when people offer you really well-meaning advice and it that can feel absolutely overwhelming and exhausting yeah. I don't know and it's almost like that adds to the mental load and what I've found that I had to do is to put that particularly people who don't who aren't living through your situation like they don't know but they'll have great ideas on what you can do and what I do with those is I accept them as a little gift and then I put them away yeah the, the unsolicited advice that you didn't yeah. ask for yeah. yeah but it can that can really be a big trigger sometimes for me yeah in terms of amplifying anxiety yeah much like I get that um can I just and, talk about this this self-regulation stuff yeah, please please just please minute, that's a really important point the time I guess when we think about self-regulation, it's, it's our ability to understand and manage our reactions to our feelings, what others might mm. be saying, and the things happening around us. And what self-care does is it helps to increase our capacity to be able to deal with these difficult feelings and emotions, okay? And I guess to, to give some examples of what you know if our if our nervous system we have a good ability to self-regulate then we're often able to better handle more intense emotions okay so like the frustrations and the anger disappointment and sadness those are difficult ones it's more likely that we'll be able to kind of calm down mm. after maybe that verbal outburst or that confrontation that you had or even with something exciting to be honest mm -hmm. It means that we can refocus our attention from one task to the next. We're not kind of dwelling and going mm. back and rethinking and rethinking. I should have, which I do a lot. I should have said that. You always come up with something kind of smarty pants that you've come up with afterwards, after the event, or maybe kind of rethinking about, I should have listened more. I should have been more compassionate. But mm. it's about control, being able to, be, able to better control our impulses. 
And if that's mm. around food, I think I want to come back to the food. It's kind of, yeah. it's being able to do that and, and being able to get along with other people. Mm. You know, that's what self-regulation means. And if we're dysregulated, it's more likely that, that we are under, we're on high alert. So we're often much more sensitive. Mm. And this might show up as being sensitive to noises. So loud noise or just hustle and bustle. I, I noticed that in myself or being at, not being able to switch off the background noise. So if the TV's yeah. on in the background, it's kind of just getting on your wick kind of thing. Um, we might be more sensitive to um, lights. Mm. So I'm going to just bring the lights down a bit. Textures of clothing. It's like, it's too scratchy. Get it off, yeah, yeah. put something. <laughs> So like layering a lovely fleecy soft blanket can just mm -hmm. help if that feels good. Yeah. Just come again, come back to yourself. Um, it shows up as not being able to switch off to be fidgety, um, mind and memory issues. And it's just interesting when I, I think about digestive issues, tiredness, all of these things that show up when our nervous system is struggling a bit, they're all, all the menopausal bits as well yeah. so this, this is why we need to come back to that yeah and why we will in a couple of episodes time because it's all everything is all linked together but we are it through that perimenopause men, menopause stage we're a little bit more sensitive to stress so all of these things may well feel amplified and then it's very hard to work out where's all this stuff coming from so i think no to, to so just go yeah, so, so the self-regulation then becomes what's really important. Yeah, and coming back to your journaling, mm. in terms of, I will often talk about just just noticing, mm. being able to pay attention, and that may be for a snippet amount of time when you perhaps come down a little bit. Um, but just in terms of, I'll often do kind of food journaling, and it just helps people become more aware mm. of maybe not just what they're eating but when they're eating and if it's if it is erratic because mm. definitely erratic eating like you're saying earlier in terms of being dehydrated is a threat to the body so mm. again it adds it adds to the cortisol but i'm really i'm not so much interested in the food per se i'm more interested in the so what was going on then yeah what was going on and around the why did i skip lunch or <laughs> why was i kind of compulsively eating the biscuits again mm. there's no judgment it's just like no. what was going on what did you notice in your body yeah and if we can practice the oh, someone really wound me up i was just i reached the end of my tether i could feel the heat in my shoulders i could feel my heart bounding i can feel you know just maybe tension in my tummy um it's like just becoming familiar with those little subtle clues yeah. can be the steps to kind of going my body's finding this difficult. Yeah. And I think that, so then, so actually that's a really good point in which we can try and bring all of this together because hopefully that helps you see or helps us see that the self-regulation and the self-care are all part and parcel of the same thing. And the self-regulation is some, is about being aware of what you, what your might be about being aware about what your body needs. And it also might be being aware about what you need um, to look after your emotions and your kind of the the back and forth around stress and such like and that self-care you almost notice when you're when you are dysregulated <clears throat> that some of those stress those some of the some of that self-care care falls out and so then your your way back to drinking the water and getting getting the walk in or whatever might be that actually first of all you need to go back to the regulation or it might be vice versa, because sometimes it's the small actions that are most helpful. And I wonder, we were going to talk a little bit about boundaries, um, and I'm aware that we're nearly at the half hour mark. So I wonder if, and we'll come back to that, I think, almost every episode, because actually that self-regulation and self-care means that you, in order to fully achieve that, you need to put boundaries around how far you are how far you are stretching yourself and how much you're going to be pulled and pushed in one in direction and almost having clear I am not going to deal with this like that kind of thing I don't know if you've got any specific anything you could add to that I think just one more note in terms of when we're feeling so much and we can feel inadequate mm. feel that we're not good enough or that we're failing at this 
I think that can make it really difficult to rationalize taking care of ourselves yeah. because we're in a body or we're in a being that we're not particularly fussed about. Mm. So again, it's really applying that compassionate lens into reminding yourself that you are human, that mm. you don't need to do everything. And we're going to come into this, I think, when we talk about the guilt around managing yeah. expectations, mm. but to, to be able to give yourself permission that even if you don't feel great about yourself, you can still take care of yeah. your body because your body is fighting for you. Yeah. It is with you the whole way. And sometimes I think we have to remember that. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Thank you, Mel. I think this is a really good place to finish. Yeah. That our body will give us the message. We need to be able to listen to it because it will help everything else. <laughs> So you can come and find us on Instagram and we're on LinkedIn. We, we are who we are, aren't we, in terms yeah. of our, our names and so on. Uh, we'll have our contact details around the video. So if you, you know if there's something here has resonated, we would love to hear from you. It's a safe place to share this stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're open to hearing about what other people's experiences are. And if you're finding things that are helping you, then, then let us know. We'd love to know. But thank you for watching. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye.